This is going to be Genesis chapter 17. And in this chapter, the Lord gives Abraham the token of the covenant, which is circumcision. It talks about this again in Romans. It says in Romans 4.11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So something significant is, Abraham got righteousness before he was circumcised. So all those people in the New Testament saying, well, you got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved, that, that doesn't even make sense because Abraham had righteousness before he was circumcised. But Abraham's physical circumcision pictures the spiritual circumcision that me and you got at salvation. You may not have known this, but here in Colossians 2, 11 through 13, it says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So you see the spiritual circumcision. You see, Abraham got the physical circumcision, me and you got a spiritual circumcision that cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now anytime you mess up and sit in the flesh, those sins aren't applied to the soul like they were back before you were saved. See, before you were saved, your soul was stuck to your flesh. So anytime you sin, those sins went on your soul. Now, the moment you believed the gospel, the moment you put your trust in Christ... You got the spiritual circumcision. God did an operation on you. He cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now anytime you sin in the flesh, those sins don't go to your soul. And that is the greatest doctrine for eternal security. Because your sins can't cause you to lose salvation because they don't get applied to your soul. When the Lord sees your soul, he sees the righteousness, the sinlessness, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So... With our spiritual circumcision in mind, since Genesis 17 is about Abraham's physical circumcision, let's keep our spiritual circumcision in mind and see what happens when you get spiritually circumcised, which is basically the same as saying when you get saved. I'm using it to say, you know, when you get saved. The first thing is when you get spiritually circumcised or saved, the Lord will appear to you. In Genesis 17, 1, it says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Okay, so Abraham was ninety-nine years old when the Lord appeared to him here. That is thirteen years after the last chapter. Thirteen is the number of rebellion. And we know that Abraham rebelled against God in chapter 16, so Abraham waited thirteen years before the Lord appeared to him again. Abraham most likely saw God as the angel of the Lord. And remember, the angel of the Lord is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you got spiritually circumcised, the moment that you got saved, you were then able to see the Lord. Not physically like Abraham did, but through the Lord's word. See, before salvation, you couldn't even understand the word of God. Now you have the ability to learn and grow from his word. While we don't see him physically, we can open up this book and the Lord will appear unto us. That's how we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The natural man, he can't even understand the word of God. It's foolishness unto him. You know, he can't see it like me and you see it. But the moment you got saved and you got that spiritual circumcision, you were able to open the book and get something out of it. In Genesis 17, 1, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Next, now that you are spiritually circumcised, you can walk before him. 
And more spe specifically, in our case, we can walk in him. You see, God tells Abraham to walk before me and be thou perfect. If you're spiritually circumcised, that means if you're saved, you believe the gospel. If you believe the gospel, then you are in Christ. You walk in him. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God tells Abraham to walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, this sounds like an impossible task, and it would be if it meant, if perfect meant sinless, it would be an impossible task. But it doesn't mean sinless. I know there's a lot of people that think they're sinless. There's a lot of people that think they don't do any wrong. But there's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. Paul said that they declared both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And notice in Second Chronicles fifteen seventeen, talking about King Asa. It says, but the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. You see, Asa's heart was considered perfect, even though the high places were not taken away. So you see, the Lord looks at the big picture. He sees the whole heart. This is why you may see some people in the ministry who have open faults and sins that they've done that have been out there in the open, but the Lord saw the whole heart, and their heart might be perfect before the Lord, so he continues to bless them, and God is definitely in their ministry and things like that. None of us are sinless, but we should try to be. Even though those sins don't get applied to the soul, we should still abstain from sin as much as we can. Paul, the apostle Paul, admits that he's not perfect. He says in Philippians 3.12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. We need to be striving to make our flesh as close to true perfection as possible. We're still going to sin. we got sinful flesh. We're waiting on our glorified body that no longer struggles with sin. But we should still try to be as close to Jesus as we possibly can. Now, when it comes to how the Lord sees the soul of a man who is spiritually circumcised, you see, when the Lord sees your flesh, you know, he knows that it's sinful flesh. But when he looks at the soul of a man who's spiritually circumcised, he does see it as sinlessly perfect because your sin doesn't get applied to it. And he, has, he had already applied the righteousness and the blood of Jesus Christ to you. So it's literally perfect, even though your flesh is not. Genesis 17, 1 and 2. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So now, something else. Now that you are born again, and you have the spiritual circumcision, you need to multiply. The Lord lets Abram know that he is going to multiply Abram exceedingly. It says in verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, So you need to fall on your face as well, and talk to God, open the Bible, and let him talk to you. It says, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So many nations will come from Abraham. The Lord is going to bless him. And this covenant has to do with land and nations. And this doesn't have anything to do with me and you. In Genesis 17, 5 and 6, it says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. So nations and kings will come out of Abraham. All the kings of Israel and Judah came from Abraham. King David came from Abraham. King Jesus 
In Matthew 1, 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, God manifested himself in the flesh through the line of Abraham. Talk about being blessed. The Lord used Abraham's line to come down in the flesh. And Abraham multiplied physical children. When you get spiritually circumcised, and I'm saying when you get spiritually circumcised as a way of saying when you got saved, because the spiritual circumcision took place the moment you got saved. So when you get spiritually circumcised, you need to multiply. Abraham multiplied physically. You need to multiply spiritually. You need to give out the gospel so that men can be born again and get spiritually circumcised themselves. You see... Kings would come out of Abraham. And when we get saved, God makes us kings and priests. It talks about in the book of Revelation chapter 1. It says he hath made us kings and priests. And when you get someone else birthed into the family of God by giving them the gospel and they receive it, they become a king. So kings can come out of you. You need to multiply and the Lord can use you to multiply. Next, when you get spiritually circumcised, you become a part of an everlasting promise. Just like Abraham had something between him and God that was everlasting. In Genesis 17, 7 through 9, it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. So God promised Abraham a piece of land. All the land of Canaan would be an everlasting possession. And did you know that when you get saved, you got an everlasting possession? Because nobody can ever take away your salvation. Paul said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nobody can take away the everlasting covenant from Abraham. Nobody can take away the everlasting salvation you possess. Abraham's seed will end up with the land. And, you know, today I'm not so concerned with his descendants having the land. I don't have to be. You know, it's in God's hands. They're going to have it in the end. Right now I'm more concerned with spiritual things and not them getting a physical land. Like, it's more important that I would that we give them the gospel and tell them how to be saved and tell them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is King. He is the Son of God. That's more important than worrying about them keeping the land. Because they're going to get it anyway. The scripture will be fulfilled that they are going to get it. So my concern is more with spiritual things now. Because we're not, in, we're not operating in the kingdom of heaven. We're operating in the spiritual kingdom of God. I'm not so concerned right now with them possessing a physical land. I'm concerned with getting them to enter into a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of heaven, that's about physical land. The kingdom of God is about spiritual things. And what God gave to Abraham was an everlasting covenant. It had to do with a physical land. And what God gave to me and you is also everlasting. But it's a spiritual thing. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we also have an everlasting possession. Now let's look at Abraham's physical circumcision. The thing that illustrates, it's a picture of our spiritual circumcision. You see, everything that's in the New Testament is pictured by something in the Old Testament. You see, this spiritual circumcision didn't come along until after the cross. Nobody got spiritually circumcised before the cross. You know, it talks about them getting uh, circumcised in the heart in the Old Testament. But that's an act of the will. In the New Testament, 
the spiritual circumcision is something that happens at salvation and you didn't even know that it took place. The Lord just does it for you. But now let's look at Abraham's physical circumcision in Genesis 17, 10 through 11. It says, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So the token of Abraham's covenant was circumcision, just like the token of Noah's covenant was a rainbow. It says in verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. Notice he told them to circumcise them at eight days old. That is significant because in the Bible, eight the number eight is the number of new beginnings. And when you are spiritually circumcised at the moment of salvation, you also start a new beginning. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. At salvation, you have a new beginning. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Genesis seventeen thirteen, And he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So even men who weren't in Abraham's line were to be circumcised as well if they came along with Abraham. Verse 14, And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So, that physical circumcision, which means absolutely nothing today. As Paul said, you know, circumcision of anything or uncircumcision, but a new creature. He, uh, Paul said in Galatians that if you be circumcised, you are debtor to do the whole law. You know, he's not speaking against people getting physically circumcised. In Galatians, Paul is speaking against people getting circumcised and using that to say that they're more righteous because of it. That's the context. You see, a lot of people are anti-physical circumcision, and they'll go to Galatians to prove that nobody should be physically circumcised, and they get real self-righteous and pharisaical about it, down people that may have circumcised their children, make them feel like dogs about it, maybe mom shame the moms for doing it, all these types of things. But Paul's not saying that it's a bad thing to get physically circumcised. He's saying it's a bad thing to get circumcised and then say that you're more righteous because of it. Because circumcision of anything nor uncircumcision. And if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's saying it's got nothing to do with salvation. It's got nothing to do with how righteous you are. It's all about Jesus Christ and getting the righteousness of Jesus Christ by believing the gospel. It has nothing to do with salvation. But in the New Testament, they were going around. In, in the book of Acts, you'll see them saying, you got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. That's what they were saying back then. But today, they're saying, you got to be water baptized and believe to be saved. You see, they've replaced circumcision with water baptism. At least around here where I'm at, that's what they say. But you see, that's not right either. Those things have nothing to do with our salvation. So physical circumcision, it's not wrong. You have all these people going around saying that it's that it's weird and that it's sick. Okay, if it's weird and it's sick, then how come God told Abraham to physically circumcise? And you know, that's what they did throughout the Old Testament that God wanted them to do. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just you don't have to be. You're at liberty to do that or not to do that. Just like they couldn't eat certain meats in the Old Testament. But today, Paul comes back and says you can eat anything as long as you can. But he basically says you can eat anything as long as you give God thanks for it. So, does that mean that... Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to eat those things. Like, say, if you read the Old Testament and you saw what they weren't supposed to eat and you went by that diet yourself, 
you know, you can do that if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just you can't come and say, well, you're more righteous or say that somebody's unrighteous for eating those things. So it's about, you know, you, you can, you can, you're at liberty to do, to eat what you want. You're at liberty to get circumcised or not get circumcised. It's just you can't use any of these decisions to say that you're more righteous for doing it or more righteous for not doing it. But, but you don't need that physical circumcision. You can, but it's got nothing to do with you being right with God. You're spiritually circumcised, and that's what makes you right with God. And you didn't even know it took place. A lot of you people listening to this right now may not have even known that when they got saved, they got spiritually circumcised. Their soul was cut loose from your, their flesh. I have never heard a preacher preach on this in person. I've heard people say it like on uh, cassette tapes and CDs and stuff like that because they're so... Very few people that even know about it or even mention it. And I think, you know, people like, I think Curtis Hudson, an old preacher, was against it, said that it's not even, he doesn't even know what it is. But yet in Colossians 2.11, it's plain there. And I mean, it's, it's a cornerstone for our eternal security. But next... What happens when you get spiritually circumcised? You get a new name. You see, something that is reserved for you when you got saved is a new name. In Revelation 2.17, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him, saving he that receiveth it. So just like Abram, got a new name, I believe the Lord already has a new name picked out for me and you. In Genesis 17, 5, it says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Abram means high father. You know, that's a lofty sounding name. Abram was a humble guy that just doesn't fit him. So God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations, because it's, that's exactly what Abraham was going to be. And that's exactly what the verse said. Notice the verse interprets the name. But thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now Genesis seventeen fifteen, it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt call her name Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. You see, Sarai means quarrelsome or contentious. But Sarah means princess. At salvation, when you got that spiritual circumcision, you also got a new name written down. Notice that two verses later, Abraham is already calling Sarai by her new name, which is Sarah. In Genesis seventeen seventeen, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? This reminds me of how I don't need to bring up the past. Abraham is calling her by her new name just two verses later. You have a new name and I don't need to dig up dirt about your lost life. I don't need to talk about what your name used to be. The next thing, when you get saved, you're spiritually circumcised, God can do the impossible through you, just like he did Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis 17, 16 and 17, God said, And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. You see, God promised a son for Abraham that he would have with Sarah, not Hagar. But it says, Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? Or shall Sarah 
that is 90 years old bear? Abraham is recognized for his faith in the New Testament. But Abraham was human and had some doubts. While it looks like Abraham never doubted, when you read about him in the, in the New Testament, you're like, wow, he just believed it. It shows he's a bit skeptical back here in the Old Testament. But look how it talks about him in the New Testament, in Romans 4, 18 through 25. It says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So if you read that, you're going to get the idea that Abraham, that there's no way Abraham laughed when God told him this promise or that he ever even doubted. But when you're reading Genesis 17, you see that Abraham laughed and was like, how's Sarah going to have a child when she's 90 years old and I'm 100 years old? And I like how in the New Testament, when it talks about these Old Testament saints, it just doesn't mention, it doesn't really mention any mess-ups they got going on. It only talks about the good stuff. And that pictures our spiritual circumcision. Because when it comes to your spiritual circumcision, your, the stuff you did in the flesh doesn't even matter. Because you're spiritually circumcised, and when God sees your soul... He doesn't see the lack of faith. He doesn't see the screw-ups and the mess-ups and the sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He just sees your faith, the good things. That's what God sees when he sees your soul now, that you've been spiritually circumcised. Just like when it gets to the New Testament. God does, in Romans 4, God doesn't even talk about Abraham's mess-up where he laughed. He just talks about he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Abraham was a man of faith, and he was the friend of God. And even he wasn't sinlessly perfect. He laughed when the Lord told him about Sarah having a child. And Sarah does the same thing in the next chapter. She also laughs. In Genesis eighteen, twelve, and 13, it says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? So you see, Sarah laughed within herself. Abraham laughed. In Genesis seventeen eighteen, And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. You see, even though God just a few verses earlier was talking about how he's going to have the son through Sarah, he still comes back and says that Ishmael might live before thee. Still talking about Ishmael. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, not Hagar. You see, God says, and Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. It's about Isaac, not Ishmael. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So God says, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. Because Abraham and Sarah both laughed. God tells them to call their son Isaac. So this is a picture how you're, even though you get right with God, you get victory over sin, your mistakes can follow you. They made a mistake by laughing at the promise of God. And God says, you want to be so funny Name him Isaac. That way you'll remember how you laughed at me, and yet what I said came to pass. You had a son, and a son named Isaac. But see, and I, he says, And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So the covenant isn't just with Abraham. It's also with Isaac and with Jacob. 
In Psalm 105, 8 through 10, it says, He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. In Genesis 26, 3, you see he gave the same promise to Jacob. He says, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. Or this is to Isaac. And I will be with thee and bless thee. For unto thee and to thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto thy father Abraham. Unto Abraham thy father. And then in Genesis 28, 13, he does the same thing with Jacob. It says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So you see, it's an everlasting covenant. Not just to Abraham, but to his seed. And this has to do with a physical land. And and it's, just, it's got nothing to do, the physical land has nothing to do with me and you as New Testament Christians. Now we're going to go into the Millennial Kingdom... And if we suffer with Christ, we'll reign with him there. But the land belongs to Israel. And if, the, and if people don't agree with that, they're going to have to deny major portions of Scripture and spiritualize things and make it say something that it doesn't say to go along with their teaching. <clears throat> I mean, if God's done with Israel, then why is he using us to provoke them to jealousy? I mean, if you're just like when maybe uh, you break up with somebody, if you're not still interested in them, why are you trying to make them jealous? You don't care about them anymore if you're just done with them. You see, God's using us to provoke them to jealousy, as it says in the New Testament. In Genesis 17, 20, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly, Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So it seems everyone who gets around Abraham is blessed, even somebody like Ishmael, a wild man. The same way that uh, Jacob has the twelve tribes that come from him, is the same way Ishmael has twelve princes. And they're listed in Genesis twenty-five thirteen through 16. Those twelve princes are listed out. And it says in Genesis seventeen twenty-one, But my covenant, will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. You see, the covenant is not with Ishmael. It's with Isaac. So he says, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So who needs an ultrasound when you're a friend of God and you can talk to God and God can see right in there? says in Ecclesiastes 11.5, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. You see, God can see right in there and see the bones growing in there. In Genesis 17.22, And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So here it seems the angel of the Lord just ascended up. And if you're spiritually circumcised, which that means if you're saved, you will ascend up one day as well. Now notice that Abraham truly has faith. Even though he laughed, you can see here that he truly has faith in what God said because look what he does in Genesis 17, 23, and 24. And Abraham took Ishmael his son and all that were born in his house and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day. And God said unto him, and Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So he does it as God said unto him to do. So that shows he had faith. He took all the males among his house and circumcised them. And see, all these people that are saying circumcision has something to do with salvation. Well, what about the women then? You know, women can't get circumcised. So... <clears throat> That doesn't make any sense to say <coughs> that it um, saves anybody. And if Abraham didn't believe, then why would he do something so painful? 
not only to himself but to all his house. This would have been a very painful thing, especially for somebody his age. For example, Jacob's sons, later on in the book of Genesis, they trick some people, Hamar and Shechem, into getting all their men circumcised. But then they just came through and wiped them all out. You see, in Genesis 34, 24 through 26, And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son, hearken up all that went out of the gate of his city. And every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. So this physical circumcision had those men so sore that two men were able to come in there and kill all of them while they were recovering from it. So imagine Abraham, 99 years old, an old man. He would have been very sore. This took a lot of faith on his part to do something very painful to himself and to all of his house. And I mean, if he did this to all the males in the house, that showed faith because somebody could have came in and took them over while they were sore, while they were unable to fight. It says in Genesis seventeen twenty five, And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So notice the number 13 popping up again. And it's associated with rebellion. And things that are negative. Here it's associated with Ishmael, who is called a wild man. Back in Genesis 13, 13, it's associated with wicked sinners, men of Sodom. Uh, back in Genesis 14, I believe, it talks about uh, 12 years they served, served Chedorlaomer, and in the 13th year, they rebelled. So you can see over and over how that number 13 is associated with rebellion, just like at the beginning of this chapter. It had been 13 years before the Lord talked to Abraham again or appeared unto him again, as far as we know, because of what rebellion he did in the last chapter by getting with Hagar. And so Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13 years old. You know, he couldn't get it done the eighth day because, you know, he's already... 13 years old at this time. And this could be why the Muslims who come from Ishmael, they don't get circumcised on the eighth day, I don't believe, but actually wait until they're older. But Genesis 17, 26 and 27, and the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son and all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Notice, it's just the men Nothing's being done to the women. So how could anybody, how do they even come up with this thing? As you read about in the book of Acts, saying that you got to be circumcised and believe to be saved. What about the women? They don't get circumcised. And see, the thing is today, they're, they're saying it's baptism. Water baptism that saves today. They replaced circumcision with water baptism. And you could really... You know, anything that anybody is relying on to save them. You could replace circumcision with that. Anything about living a good life in general. None of that saves you. It's all about the faith. Placing your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. 